Okay. This conference we re- will now be recorded. Oh, brilliant. That's what I was waiting for. Just checking we're recording it. Um, yeah, as, as Lynn said, just a quick introduction uh, to myself. I'm Pete Verriard. I'm a track PE based with the CRSA in crew. Um, and I'm also uh, co-chair of the uh, PWI Chester in North Wales section. Um, and I've, I've been, been asked today to come in and do a presentation on a recent renewal that we carried out, an SNC renewal at Earlstown, uh, which was uh, last year. Um, I know generally we quite like to uh, do a couple of presentations a year in the section on some kind of a, a kind of a relevant and recent project. So um, I have given this presentation before at one of the track engineering working groups. So apologies if anybody was was in attendance at that, but there were some quite interesting points that came out the back of that. Um, in the discussion, which I have incorporated into this presentation. So hopefully there should be something of interest in here for everyone from a PUA perspective. Um, as Lynn said, I've got a little kind of discussion section at the end. So uh, feel free to post any questions in the chat um, or otherwise uh, feel free to post them at the end and I can hopefully provide an answer. Sorry, I'll just wait for my... Uh, Sorry, it's not letting me skip the slide. Oh, there we go. Just a quick, uh, quick one about uh, Earlstown. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware of its location, uh, it's located up in Lancashire, uh, so in the northwest and central region, um, and it's roughly equidistant between Liverpool and Manchester, as you can probably see on on this diagram here. Located just off the West Coast Main Line, so um, Earlstown basically sits on a triangle uh, on on this line, which is the Chat Moss Line, which runs between Liverpool and Manchester. And um, there's then a short spur comes off the West Coast Main Line here, um, which basically joins in two directions to form a, a triangle, uh, which is Earlstown Station. So to give a, a little bit of history to this, because I, I like my history. Um, it is an incredibly historic part of the railway network around here and um, this is located on uh, the world's first intercity railway line between Liverpool and Manchester which I don't think needs any introduction it's very famous and the station itself was constructed as Newton Junction back in 1830 so it, it is one of the oldest stations that we probably have on our infrastructure um, it became a junction shortly after opening uh, in 1831 uh, with the construction of what was called the Liverpool Curve going from a west to south direction and um, this basically joined the Liverpool and Manchester line to the Grand Junction Railway which had come south from the crew direction um, and about eight years later another curve was created on the site called the Manchester Curve uh, which basically connected that kind of southerly uh, junction to the east as well um, and it basically gave the triangular shape um, and triangular form which Earlstown is famous for now. Um, it, it is worth noting that this is pretty much the original London to Liverpool and Manchester main line. Um, obviously that the current main lines weren't built until a decade or two later so this tiny triangle of railways in Lancashire was one of the kind of the key places on the railway network in the 18, 1830s, 40s, going onwards. Um, a couple of facts here as well. It's apparently the oldest passenger railway junction in the world. Well, I'm not 100% sure about the wording of that fact, um, but I can tell you it is one of only two triangular railway stations that's left in the UK. Um, and I would give a prize for anybody who can name the other one if you can put it in the chat, but. Obviously, I can't give out any prize online. Um, but a, li- a little comment just at the end there, which I think is quite an interesting one. Lancashire is historically a, a very, an area kind of full of heavy medium industries. Um, and for that reason, there were numerous freight only lines in and around the area, um, kind of of this station. 
And I kind of think that this is re kind of relevant, if we will, to, to some of what we're going to come on to later. Um, I've just put up quite a nice diagram here. Um, I think it's kind of early BR era, so probably 19, uh, 1950s, I think, although I've not actually confirmed this, but it just gives you quite a nice um, view of the um, the concentration of, of kind of railway infrastructure in this area um, back in the day, if you will, um, and the complexity of the, the track layout um, around the triangle. You can see on this diagram that the, the Liverpool to Manchester Chat Moss line goes from west to east, east to west. Um, and then the Liverpool curve and the Manchester curves go from the west and east junctions uh, to the south junction and on to Winnick Junction and the west coast main line. Um, I don't really need to explain the fact that there, there were a lot of other kind of uh, bits of rail infrastructure in this area. We've got lines going to various collieries um, in the Lancashire coal fields. Uh, we've got engineering works uh, located here, there and everywhere railway sidings um, and the uh, Vulcan foundry, which is quite a famous old locomotive works, isn't located a million miles away from here. Um, but the reason I'm kind of going a little bit off topic and going into this is because I think, especially around the South Junction, which is this area, this historic track layout has had kind of a, a bearing on, on the legacy of, of the track, um, kind of the existing track layout, if you will, within this area. Um, and additionally, the inherent design of Earl Town Station being on a triangle has also had a pretty significant bearing on, on kind of the layout in this area and on us as a project. You can just see from these pictures how tight the curvature is going through the, uh, the Liverpool curve and the Manchester curve. Um, there's a reason why we don't um, generally build triangular stations anymore and a reason why we don't build platforms or we try and avoid building flat platforms on uh, significant curve curvature. Just kind of coming forward to the modern day now, um, you can see from a couple of photos that the track layout has been significantly rationalised in recent years. This photograph on the right shows the Chatmos line going from the top to the bottom of the picture. Um, it's worth noting that all of this around Earlstown, all the lines have now been electrified. This is still a really key route, um, the line between Liverpool and Manchester, really important. The part of the layout which has probably suffered the most, if, or if you will call it that, with rationalisation, is the Liverpool curve, which is now just a single bi-directional line going through Platform 3. Um, the view on the left here is of Earlstown South Junction, and you can see the single line coming in from this direction. The Manchester curve going through platform four and five is still double track. Um, just wait for this to update. So kind of looking at the, um, the track layout coming off the back of what I've just said there, you can see that it's very different to the older diagram that I've shown you now, a, a lot more simple and rationalised. The west and the east junctions, or the Liverpool and Manchester junctions, were renewed in 2013 by one of the predecessors of the Central Rail Systems Alliance. Um, so those two layouts are relatively new. Um, and the work that we are remitted to do as a project concerned the south junction or the Warrington junction. So kind of the way I looked at it, it's almost kind of completing the, the other corner of this triangle. Um, most of the track assets in this area around the junction itself were, were kind of dating from the 1990s, um, but some of the uh, some of the infrastructure um, within the platforms itself, from a track perspective, was a lot older. So just to come on to the um, the existing condition of the asset, if you will. Um, the photograph on the left is showing platform three in the down and up Liverpool curve. You can see from this photo that the track system was looking pretty knackered, um, a lot of vegetation um, and ballast contamination, which is um, kind of a legacy, if you will, of all the coal traffic that was running through here until recently. Um, and the, uh, the sleepers and rails, uh, fastenings, etc., were all life expired through here. So the maintainer was really struggling with, with a lot of gauge faults through this area um, and was kind of struggling to keep on top of these. Um, and it was quite clear that a renewal was required through here. 
Platform three, uh, again, you can kind of see through here just how tight the curvature is through that platform. Um, and this was obviously going to be quite a significant issue to us as a project because we were going to be renewing through this platform. Um, and there's, there's a few bashes that have happened over time here as well uh, on some of the copers where obviously things, things haven't gone right with, uh, with regards to gauging and stepping distances. Um, just going up to the top right hand photo here, again, it kind of shows you the condition of the track in this area. Um, and it also shows you one of the kind of quirks that you sometimes get working in a maybe kind of a lower uh, kind of category of area like this. Um, you don't generally install trough routes through track as standard. Um, and they, they obviously cause us some quite significant issues when we do come across them. So lots of kind of little quirks, uh, around this job which made things a little bit trickier from both a design and a construction perspective than you may initially think. Um, the kind of second driver for this job, um, there's kind of a clue for it in the bottom right hand corner there in this photograph and it's the fact that um, there was a pretty significant increase in tonnage um, across this route with just about within the last decade or so. Um, you might recognise this is one of the biomass trains uh, which runs from the port of Liverpool um, all the way across to Drax power station in North Yorkshire. Um, and all of these services utilise this single line through platform three. So they, they come onto the Chatmoss lines, uh, come off at Earlstown West Junction, uh, go through to Winnick Junction and then onto the West Coast and eventually on to uh, towards Yorkshire. Um, now, when this traffic was introduced, the RAM did have a quite a big package of work, I think, to understand uh, the, the resilience of the existing infrastructure and what upgrades were required um, to, to the track to accommodate this. Um, but at that time, um, neither the turnout or this single line or the crossover were in this area were renewed. So. Um, as you can expect, with that increase in tonnage, those track assets have really suffered from a condition perspective, um, especially the crossover where the crossing noses have been battered or were battered to bits um, at the time where we came to um, work on this. So I think just to give a bit of clarity about the scope um, of this project, the diagram at the bottom of this slide, which you can hopefully all see, quite clearly shows the limits of our renewal and our scope. So we are required to renew the turnout and the crossover, which form Earlstown South Junction. Um, and in red here, you can also see that there is associated plane line all the way through platform three um, and running out before platform four and five. Additionally, um, we were asked to investigate the possibility of utilizing a larger switch size um, for the crossover. Again, that's as a result of that additional freight traffic, looking to try and reduce the wear um, from increasing the, uh, the footprint of the crossover. Um, and we are also tasked with recovering a redundant sand drag off the end of platform three, which wasn't required um, as a form of protection anymore. We worked in uh, kind of a relatively interesting setup for, for us in in the Central Rail Systems Alliance. As PEs, we generally work in grip four to eight um, and, and work uh, from kind of um, form A onwards, if you will. Um, however, for this job, we were working under a grip one to three DPE within track development. Um, and that also meant that we had our Alliance design team working on this and also had a lot of early involvement from our development engineers and our lead construction engineer. In itself, um, that was quite an interesting learning curve for us, I think, but it, it was very beneficial being able to get involved in a job like this at that earlier stage within development. Um, and it meant that we were able to um, kind of uh, implement some additional kind of scope changes, which I'll come on to now. So the, the PRS and the GRIP3 design were updated um, to allow us to implement a number of kind of additional bits of scope or improvements above the existing scope itself. 
So the first one of those is that our design team were able to uh, increase the, the crossover size from a CVS nine and a quarter to a DVS 15. Uh, obviously the assessment was done there and it was determined that that would be favorable uh, with regards to the, um, the, the life of the asset um, and include niceness of the freight traffic. Additionally, and probably one of the key points, you'll see that the crossover itself has been relocated about 70 meters to the north towards Earls Town Station. Now this is kind of coming on to the, the point I made earlier about the legacy of the existing track design in this area. Um, the existing crossover was located a couple of hundred meters away from the turnout. Um, and I think the reason for that, looking back through previous diagrams, is, is probably because of the, the amount of additional S&C that used to be in this area um, and the complexity of the track layout. But for kind of the, the operational railway today, that wasn't really the, the, the kind of the best way um, for, for us to be renewing the track. Um, and our design team were able to, to discuss this with our signalling colleagues and determine that there'd be quite a significant operational uh, benefit from moving the crossover to the north and towards the station. A couple of other points from a track perspective, which we were able to um, include within our GRIP3 design. Uh, 755 points, or 755 alpha as it was then, was a two-leveled layout, which is obviously non-preferred from both a maintenance and a um, kind of a, a, a construction perspective on our side. So um, the, the design team were able to design that out, which was hugely beneficial. And additionally, the line through platform three, the down and up Liverpool curve, um, was um, all can was, was removed from that. Uh, so that obviously has a benefit uh, with regards to both uh, stepping distances to the platform and with regards to rolling contact fatigue, uh, because it's obviously a very slow speed curve, 20 mile an hour through there. So kind of just, just moving on a little bit now within the design. Um, there, there were a few challenges kind of going from grip three to grip four to eight. Um, the main kind of one there was that there was quite a late handover of this project from the grip one to three team to the alliance. That wasn't generally to do with, with our um, anything from a track discipline because we, we were quite happy with the grip three design that we were able to come up with. It was more um, kind of other disciplines that had kind of stopped things being signed off. Um, but the main consequence of that was that we were working within a relatively constrained design program um, going forward from GRIP4. Um, additionally, this job also kind of went from GRIP3 to GRIP4 at the time that the Central Rail Systems Alliance came into being. So before this, we were part of the SNC North Alliance. Um, and as part of that, we got a a new design team, so an entirely new design team taking this forward from GRIP4. Um, in itself, um, not necessarily the biggest issue, but the, the new design team obviously needs a bit of additional time to kind of familiarise themselves with the scheme and take things forward. So we ended up having to make some pretty significant design changes from GRIP4 onwards, um, and these were generally points that had been uh, deferred to either deferred to GRIP4 or had been bought up um, a little bit later on as a result of our discussions with um, the sponsor or the asset owner. So one of the one of the main ones there was the fact that the original 753 Alpha Bravo crossover design and the existing layout were, uh, well, didn't have a standard six foot interval through them. Now, from a construction perspective, we wanted to install this as a modular crossover um, and additionally, um, the maintainer obviously is, is interested in this being um, a, a standard layout um, with a compliant six foot. This obviously was a bit of a challenge to, to the design team because they pretty much had to redesign the whole up Earlstown line to bring uh, to kind of bring that alignment in, into where it needed to be. However, with regards to 753 Alpha Bravo crossover, we were able to um, kind of in, improve the scope, if you will, to actually allow that crossover to be strengthened um, and to allow that to sit within CWR going pretty much all the way up to the station. 
again that was a comment that came from the uh, the ram team and the maintainer because it's it's well within their interest to have that as, as cwr as, as as much as they can um and we also had a, a change in the renewal limits going through the single line through platform three um there'd been a small island of timber sleepers that had kind of been lost between our renewal and the previous one um, and it was obviously within everyone's interest there to try and get rid of those wherever possible so i think the final point i've got on here which i thought i'd probably bring up is maybe again coming from the, the legacy of the track layout in this area um but mainly it's the fact that um the gradients were pretty significant kind of coming from the south towards the station so getting a, a good vertical alignment tie-in was was really really tricky in effect you can see from this long section extract that we've got gradients of nearing one in a hundred um basically coming into existing um so it was really kind of difficult trying to get a good tie-in um uh, on both lines to the south um without ending up chasing our tail all the way through to kind of winning junction um but we were able to um we were able to come up with a fairly good solution there in the end and also accommodate all of the um design changes which i've listed previously so just to bring up an extract uh from our afc design i've, I've kind of just pulled out this section in detail because there's a couple of points which i thought were quite interesting from a p-way perspective and potentially a relatively unique to this job i think the first thing you'll probably see from this drawing this this is the turnout uh, 755 points um platform four and five and the manchester curve are off in this direction and uh, the liverpool curve and platform three is just off screen here so 755 points is the the snc where we, we remove the two leveling um and we were able to install this as a standard turnout with the straight uh sorry the through route and a straight coming onto platform three because that is our predominant direction of traffic with all the freight coming through here um in itself this this was brilliant from a, a kind of a maintenance perspective but it obviously does give you a couple of issues with regards to your uh, your transitions um, and your geometry you can see um from this diagram that we're tying into a 155 meter curve going into platform four um, and we've also require a 180 meter curve um going through into platform three to enable us to tie in uh, to the platform in time even though um obviously we've removed the snc from the sand drag so kind of taking that two leveling out causes a few issues potentially but the benefits far outweigh those um you do end up with a transition pretty much off your last long bearer which is never really preferable from a maintenance perspective but it was kind of the way we had to go with it and you, you can see that um another feature of going into platform four was we're, we're pretty much ramping up to 75 mil camp into this curve um, and then we're running the limit of our renewal is around here and we were running out asap pretty much before the platform because we weren't remitted to go into platform form and do any renewal through there just another another comment that i'll bring up here as well you can probably see from the topo that the cable management in this area um was relatively uh well left a little bit to be desired um, i know historically we weren't necessarily constrained with the same uh kind of signaling standards that we have now for our cable management but as a project we were obviously in a little bit of a tricky position with this because we we needed to look to uh, move um, a lot of cables and ensure that these could tra traverse our lines um signaling were quite keen for us to install as many hollow bearers as we could in this area but at the time of um the project we we couldn't find any hollow bearer that was approved for use um in a check railed area um well within within a, this kind of check rail so as a result of this we need a quite a significant signaling uh kind of scope of work to to take our cabling uh, off the front of the snc and through hollow bearers in in this direction um off the back of the track engineering working group where 
um, where we discussed this, we did actually discover that there is now a, an approved hollow bearer, which can be used in, in this instance. Um, so going forward, that's definitely something which would be really useful to us on any similar projects like this. I think the final point that I'll probably raise on this diagram that kind of is, is to do with the check rail requirements. Uh, you can see that there is an existing check rail through platform four and, and that is mandated uh, for um, a radii of, of sub 200 meters. Um, the radius through platform three is actually above 200 meters, it's 213, but we required were required to install a check rail on this 180 meter curve and, and the RAM and our risk assessments were, were quite clear in what they said, which is that the check rail should continue all the way through the curve um, until it reaches um, more, more favorable geometry, if you like, out the other end of the platform. Um, so in itself, this wasn't a particular issue, um, except for the section going into platform four. Um, as you're probably aware, the, the check rail within um, the SNC uh, within the NR56V is, is a flat bottom check rail um, and there is then an interface going into our, our continuous check within the plane line panels which is SEN33. So uh, we've got two different check rail types which is something we, we manage on a lot of our jobs. However, coming into the existing um, track on the Down Earlstown, we, we have a bullet check. So we basically ended up with three different check rail systems within a 50 meter um, length of track. So going from and transitioning from flat bottom check to SEN 33 is not a particularly big issue because there's um, well, kind of a, a fish plate, a junction plate, which connects between the two of those. However, we couldn't find any approved method of um, creating a continuous check between uh, bullet check rail and SEN 33. Um, and we we explored our options with with other engineers uh, from other projects and teams uh, with the route. And the only solution that we could actually come up with for this was uh, an air gap between the two systems. And you can see a diagram of this here. This is something which we actually um, kind of got from our colleagues over in our depot in Doncaster, because they'd installed a similar um, arrangement on Newcastle a couple of years before. So th this was something which we were able to agree agree with the RAM, as, which we thought was a relatively novel solution. Um, but then bringing it up at the track engineering working group, there were quite a significant amount of people who, who have done this as uh, fairly standard um, over quite a few years. So um, it, it is a bit of an issue, but it is this is a tried and tested solution for this. Something interesting which did also came off the back of that working group was that there was a, an engineer from London Underground on there who um, said that apparently there is a system which can be used to, to connect these two check rail types together. I'm not actually sure whether that is, uh, well, what that is or whether it's been product approved. Um, but again, going forward, it's something which we'll definitely look into uh, as a potential solution. Probably actually the last point before I move on from this slide, I will just mention the um, the interface between um, the down and up Liverpool curve and platform three. Uh, stepping distances and clearances are obviously two really important considerations when we're working in and around platforms. We were able to design a pretty favourable alignment through the platform um, and the fact that we are reducing the cant to zero meant that we were able to improve all of our XY offsets um, relatively significantly above what they were. Um, however, we weren't able to bring those um, into standard. Um, however, again, this, this kind of needs to be taken um, in the context of the fact that this is a track renewal. Um, but we were able to get uh, those improved X and Y offsets agreed. And from a gauging perspective, we were able to demonstrate uh, positive clearances through there for all uh, current and aspirational stock. Moving on to the construction uh, itself, um, there were quite a few different um, kind of construction sequences and methodologies that were um, that were tested uh, all the way from grip three through to um, kind of uh, grip four and five. 
Um, we ended up settling on a, a construction strategy that was staged over three core weekends, uh, which were all consecutive weekends. In the first weekend, we'd be renewing the crossover uh, towards the south end of the job. In the second weekend, we were to renew the um, the turnout and the line kind of running out just before platform four. And then in the third weekend, we were renewing the single line through platform three. So the construction engineer was really closely involved um, with all of our design reviews and, and with the job all the way through platform three. That's generally the way we work in the Alliance. We have a lot of construction involvement. Um, but the increase in track scope, as you've probably picked up on, was a challenge. Um, and the construction engineers really had to kind of rerun the, uh, their assessments, uh, change, make changes to their bar charts and their plans to make sure they could accommodate those changes. Um, the site itself was also relatively constrained. Um, the double track section you can see in that photo isn't particularly constrained, although you do have OLE um, all the way through there. But the area in and around the platform and the station itself is, is quite a tricky place to be working, um, especially as there are still redundant platforms and other structures um, opposite platform three. Um, and carrying out any track renewal on a single line is always always trickier than it is when you have an adjacent road to be working off. So um, I think probably quite a critical point as well is, is um, was our relationship with our S&C manufacturer. Um, I've already mentioned the fact that we were working within a pretty constrained design program. And even at the best of times, our manufacturer's lead times and programs don't generally align with our grip for track. Um, or our project um, uh, programs, if you like. So we really had to work closely with, with the manufacturer all the way through to kind of keep them up to date on everything, make sure they had all the information they needed to, to construct the layout in time. Um, we pretty much ended up having weekly conversations with them kind of around the Form B stage um, just to make sure everybody was was kind of on, on the same uh, on the same page, if you will. Um, and additionally, um, construction needed quite a significant amount of input uh, with regards to the staging requirements um, in the S&C uh, manufacture. So making sure we had over long rails where necessary at our tie-ins, making sure that our check rail joint positions were on the correct side of our track joints going through the um, single line based on the direction of, uh, of construction. So the, the team at Progress Rail were, were fantastic for supporting us through this. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of a bit of a, I think a testament to that working relationship that we were able to, um, to meet all of the timescales and get the design, uh, well, the 150s approved and the design AFC'd um, in the required timescales. Um, kind of picking up on the staging interfaces as well, um, I've already mentioned the three uh, stages that the job was being constructed in um, and the kind of tricky vertical alignment that we had through this site meant that we weren't able to um, accommodate a massive amount of uh, vertical repositioning from the existing design. Now when, you, when you're digging out and renewing your, your well any track that doesn't really matter but when you're coming to um, your tie-ins between different stages where you're potentially going to be running your tamper out uh, multiple times um, through a section of track that you previously installed, you really need to consider the amount of lift that you have in your design um, all the way through the cycle of those um, follow-up tamps um, and associated core tamps. Um, and this was something that the uh, construction team did brilliantly, um, making sure to leave the job um, not too low, but appropriately low, so they had the um, available, well, the required amount of lift in consecutive weekends, um, but not so much to um, end up with a, a stiff design or a design or a construction that's stiff against design. So I mean that, that that's an interesting one as well, and it's it's one that we we do kind of have a problem with on 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 some uh, stage designs, especially. Um, 
I think the last point I was going to bring up on it, you might have been looking whilst I've been talking at the diagram in the bottom right hand corner there and maybe wondering what's going on. Um, that is a cross section of a UTX that was installed uh, in 2013 um, when the East Junction was renewed. Um, this was a design that was sent through from the civils team a couple of weeks before um, the, the design was AFC'd. Um, and you can see there that it's a bit of an unconventional UTX design, which has basically been uh, ramped over um, an existing brick culvert, which is shown in red near there. Now, that brick culvert was running pretty much directly below the Down Earlstown through quite a significant amount of Platform 4. Um, I'm pretty certain that it's, uh, well, judging by the fact it's a brick culvert and the fact that it's underneath about a meter below the, the track, I think it probably is from when this line was first constructed. So potentially you've got a brick culvert there that's nearly 200 years old. It wasn't within our renewal limits or our tamping limits. So you might think it's not an issue, but the fact that we were going to be traversing a, a pretty um, heavy Kirov crane um, over that line was a concern for us. Um, and we had a pretty mad rush kind of in the weeks before um, kind of the renewal and before our design being issued to make sure that we had um, appropriate track monitoring um, there um, just to make sure that there wasn't any deterioration of the downhills down from a potential collapse of the culvert. Um, you might be saying, why didn't you pick this up in the hazard directory? Um, the answer was it wasn't actually in there. Um, so um we would it would have been a lot easier if we had known about that beforehand but we were able to kind of pull together as a team to make sure we, we did mitigate against the risk from that the uh the construction of the job itself uh went went brilliantly if i'm being honest um the full volume of work was delivered um and all the possessions were handed back on time which is always really beneficial especially in an area um, where your, your possession is affecting multiple routes as it is here. Just a, um, a bit of a shout out as well, or, or rather a mention of the use of the tilting road wagon uh, from Lawson's. Um, we use this for the delivery of the 755 um, points because they were a conventional turnout. Um, I, I'm aware that the use of this tilting road wagon isn't particularly um kind of maybe a particularly big thing anymore but it, it was really fantastic for our purposes not only does it give you the assurance that your layout isn't going to get damaged um whilst it's being transported and um, it also meant that we were able to bring it directly to site um a week before um its renewal um and lay it down as it was um off track uh, ready to basically be craned in the following weekend Another shout out as well to the construction team. As, as a PE, I was really happy to see the use of the new temporary joint online register. Um, this job required quite a lot of temporary joints to be installed. I think there was about 60 or 70 from memory. Um, and that was basically just down to the fact that our um, core accesses were so constrained and um, that we weren't able to carry out the welding that we, we needed to within those. Um, the temporary joint online register, I think, it is now compulsory or will be when the new standard comes out um, for temporary joints. Um, however, we, we wanted to kind of give that assurance um, to, to ourselves and, and to, to, to the, our root colleagues um, by using that. And um, it, it was really good from, from my perspective to see the construction team embrace that. I think the final point as well is a really pertinent one, especially to us in crew at the moment. Um, I had a lot of focus as PE on uh, keeping on top of um, the, the monitoring of, of track quality through this renewal after the um, uh, after the core weekends have passed. Um, it's obviously one of our KRAs as an alliance is track quality, um, and it, it is one of the main ways that we are measured and. Um, are kind of rated as as a, a track delivery team, if you will. Um, so I was keeping an eye on on the track recording runs um, on a kind of probably two three times a week 
um, where we did have any runs, um, I was pulling down the, the raw ASCII data. It basically gives you your your measurements five point uh, five points every meter. So it's it's really kind of detailed stuff. Um, and I was able to work with the construction team to basically review that. And where we did have any areas where the track quality did look a little bit kind of poor, we were able to target that um, really kind of closely um, in any of our follow up tamping. Um, and obviously we were able to utilize our as builds as well in that assessment. And that's, I think that was probably one of the um, qu quite a good bit of practice, to be honest. Um, we ended up coming out with um, a, uh, a site score of 95 percent, which is um, pretty good, to be honest. It's, well, it's, it's very good for, for an SNC site, especially one like this. Um, and I think that kind of exercise did contribute to that um, and the result that we got from that. So I think just to give a little bit of a quick summary, um, Earlstown itself was a renewal of three point ends and an abandonment uh, of another. So on on kind of on the face of it, potentially it's not a particularly complex job, um, and it, it may not sound it, but there's so many kind of kind of unique constraints um, kind of in and around this area, particularly with the legacy of the track layout, the um, the platforms, the tight curvature, um, and the fact that we accommodated so many kind of scope changes throughout meant that this was a much trickier job to design and install than it, it may first have appeared. However, from, from my benefit as, as kind of an NR representative, if you will, within the Alliance, I think it's a brilliant um, example of, of, of PPF, putting passengers first. Um, which is obviously um, one of the key kind of um, objectives here within network rail um, because we really engage with the maintainer um, and we engage with the RAM team um, and the operations to make as many reasonable scope adjustments as we could to really give the best um, or, or rather do the best for this section of railway that we could. I mean, I think the amount of changes that we were able to accommodate are, are kind of testament to that and will have a benefit not only on reliability uh, for passenger traffic, but also for the freight traffic that uses this route. Um, and I, I think the fact that we are able to work with the design, uh, construction and uh, teams and the manufacturer um, and also the sponsor and asset management so closely meant that we are able to make a success of that and that any risk that we were importing was reasonable and manageable from those changes. So yeah, I think um, that's that's probably it from me. Um, I'm hoping people have found it uh, relatively interesting. Um, I'll just open up the um, open up the floor to anyone who, who has any questions. Um, just opening up the chat. Um, the first is, yeah, is Pete Halliwell suggesting that the other triangular junction might be Dinting? Is he correct? He, sorry, he is correct, but I don't think Dinting has a platform on every corner. Um, oh. Sorry, I might not, I might not have mentioned that close enough, but yeah, you are right. <laughs> Dinting is a triangle, isn't it? Um, I think he might have platforms on one, one side. I'm not sure, but. Yeah, it's a good it's a good suggestion. Um and I imagine Dinting's probably got quite a few similar kind of constraints that we have here to be honest. Oh, and more with the viaduct. Um uh, Phil's suggested Shipley. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think it, it's either Shipley or Skipton, I've forgotten now. I think it might, yeah. Someone might have to Google that whilst I'm answering the questions. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely one of those one of those two in that area. So you asked a question that you didn't actually know the answer to. <laughs> yeah, I thought I, I thought I did when I started off, but <laughs> oh, you're not so sure. <laughs> um, uh, we've got one, we've got one question in from John Parker for you, um, Pete. Could a welded solution have been used between the bullhead and flat bottom check rails? and were significant changes required to the hourly? Sorry, two questions. Yeah, so um, we didn't really look too much into a welded solution. Um, I think it might have been because we thought the profiles were 
were too different between the Bullhead and the, the Sen 33. Um, and we wouldn't necessarily have kind of a mold to hand to maybe allow that. But it would probably be the perfect solution um, if, if there was, um, if, if, if there kind of was scope to do that. Um, with regards to the, the question about OLE, um, I think I'd probably pick this up from two, um, two kind of points of view here. The first one is the, the crossover itself um, did require some uh, reasonably, obviously significant OLE changes. I think it was two new structures that were required, obviously with the, the crossover being renewed. Uh, rem uh, moved by 70 meters so there was some quite significant OLE rework there um, additionally one of the points that I made about the geometry um, off uh, off the heel of, of 755 and, and kind of going through to platform three we really had to be careful there the amount of realignment that we we were kind of doing through that 180 meter curve so we had a lot of conversations with our OLE colleagues to make sure any uh, track slews that we had in those areas um, could be accommodated within the um, the existing uh, OLE infrastructure. Now, we were actually able to slew by, I think, I think it was between 100 and 200 mil. There were some quite significant slews through there, um, but I think because the um, the OLE gantries were were so kind of new and had only been installed within the last 10 years or so i think uh, meant that there was quite a lot of um kind of give within those if you will so we, we were able to install that new alignment without too much reworking of the ole before we move on to the, the next question yeah i can confirm that shipley is the um is the other station apparently ambergate used to also be triangular but now it only retains one platform so there you go trivia for this evening over um p halliwell yeah, asks well, yeah. if you can tell us a bit more about the drainage works apart from the utf you've already described yeah so it's quite a pertinent question this one because um we often let ourselves down, I think, with track renewals, with, with the amount of importance that we actually give to associated drainage works. Um, and it can have an issue for um, for kind of network rail as the asset owner, but also on in kind of the short term for us as a project um, where we're not necessarily uh, correcting any, any drainage issues within the area. Um, and we can potentially have some quite significant track quality issues. Um, and longer term issues for the asset itself. With regards to Earlstown, there weren't any associated drainage works with this job. Um, there's kind of a couple of reasons for that. The first one is um, the fact that I, th I think a reasonable amount of the site was, was generally um, uh, relatively free draining itself and didn't have any existing drainage issues. Um, the area around the crossover had um, pretty significant ballast fouling um, and that was as a result of the drainage system within that area being uh, non-functional. Effectively, you had um, channel drains on both sides of the track which sat way too high against a crossfall and against a formation um, and were, were full with ballast, basically. Um, so we had conversations with the drainage ram team fairly early doors i think grip two and grip three and they basically um said that the drainage works they wanted to take them um as a separate work item going forward now i think with hindsight we could probably maybe question whether whether we should have done that um, as part of the track renewal, but that was kind of the instruction that we got was that would be taken forward as a, a separate work item. Um, and I think the maintainer's feedback as well was that he he was obviously going to kind of wasn't too concerned about that, but just wanted it to be picked up um, as uh, as part of the Rams work bank going forward. Hopefully that answers a question. It might not be the most convincing answer, but um, yeah, that just about summarises the drainage works. Um, I think, Jim, have you got a question? It looks like I think you might have your hand up there. 
Yes, good evening to everybody. Um, I'm from down south, so I'm a bit of a visitor to your area. Um, retired track engineer and part, long used to be part of Eastleigh S&C, which some of you may have heard of. Uh, a couple of comments first. It's lovely to see an outfit like Lawson's have done a tremendous job. They used to serve me incredibly well with transport, um, and it's lovely to see they have kept there, despite being out on the limb in, in the west of Cumbria. Um, the second point is, as an old area engineer, I'm rather horrified, to be truthful, about the incredible amount of paperwork and organization needed to do what, as an area engineer, I would have specified, I would have done most of the design for, um, and it would have done by the half a dozen people in my office. Uh, I rather think today is a bit bad, but anyway, that, that's, that's one of the ways places we find ourselves. I have a question though, the, uh, which is not very clear to me, because uh, I don't know the area, the CV nine and a quarter right hand turnout, uh, am I right in thinking that the circular curve through the turnout extends through the front of the switches and, 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 and southwards from there? Um, the, uh, no, it's, um, uh, it's, it's basically just a standard turnout, uh, with, with the straight off the fronts of the S and C. It is straight off the fronts. Okay. It, uh, it is. Yeah. A, a, a slight caveat to that is there is a, um, to kind of bring the alignment, uh, kind of, uh, back in before we get to the crossover, there was kind of one of these, uh, nominally pretty significant high radius curves and a little bit further down between the two straights um it's it's always something which is a bit of an odd one from a design perspective but yeah uh, to, just to answer your question it was straight off the front so okay. the, uh, the issue that i was was looking at is whether the thing should have actually been a the switches should have been right hand turnout or left hand turnout off a through curve and and in the context of the fact that um I guess much of the traffic is going through to platform four. Everything that goes that way hits the switch angle, um, which might have been better to come off the other way. Anyway, um, if it hasn't, isn't a continuing curve, sorry for interrupting everybody, but interesting stuff. Thank you. No, it's a good, it's a good point, Jim. The um, with regards to the traffic, I was pretty amazed when we when we did this assessment because the um, the tonnage through platform three which is a single line is 10 times the tonnage as it is going into platform four which was was pretty amazing to be honest for me because um platform four and five is you get a fairly significant amount of traffic through there i know that the manchester wales trains go through there amongst amongst others um but it, it is just the amount of freight going through there um but yes yeah, it's, it's a really interesting point and obviously what was something very important for us to consider Thank you. Any more questions, guys? No? Okay. <laughs> if there's no more questions, I'll I'll hand over to Pete Hollywell, please. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you very much. Pete, excellent. Excellent start that you've given us this evening. I'm de delighted to say a few words and offer a vote of thanks for this. Brought back quite a few memories for me um, from about 17 years ago, going out and camping all around that area. Um, and it's an area I'm, I'm reasonably familiar with because my daughter lives just around the corner from there. So um, fascinating to hear. Um, and it's really good to hear the real world engineering. Um, in the modern day. I think um, in your presentation, Ian Couch said to me many years ago, um, any presentation has to begin with a history lesson. So you were true to that with a very good history lesson and the context of the Liverpool and Manchester and the Grand Junction Railways. I was really pleased to hear about the continuity between the design development process in group one to three and the problem solving that you took through from that in 
um, the group four design and um, thinking back through the construction design and all the problem solving. Really good to hear about taking into consideration the maintenance bit and reasonable opportunities for betterment. So um, relocating the crossover and, and improving the geometry through the area, which is all um, excellent to hear. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. Um, I probably do share the slight disappointment of the failure to um, tackle associated drainage, but um, be that as it may, it, it doesn't require what looks like to have been a fantastic thing. So could I ask everybody that's uh, here this evening to join me in thanking Pete for uh, putting together a presentation and um, answering all of our questions. Thank you very much, Pete. Thank you. Please join us. Brilliant. Thanks, Peter.